Hi, everybody. I am going to do my lecture over special populations. Uh, as you can tell, it's a very short chapter, chapter four. Uh, so I'm not going to really go through every special population. I'm really going to focus on trauma surgery because that's what I have a lot of extra information for you about. A lot of this is review, right? So I'm not, again, I'm not going to go into much detail because it's all review for you. I hope you take this opportunity on this short chapter to do a review for yourself. Get out your anatomy book and go through all the stuff that you haven't read in a long time. So I urge you to use this as a review for yourself. But I will go ahead and get started. So I'm on page 50. So it goes way back to the beginning of the book, Special Populations. If, if you notice, the program kind of does a little up and down. So you just have a really difficult chapter and now it dipped down to give you a little bit of a break right before neurosurgery. So we are going to dip back up for our last class neurosurgery. So special populations starts on page 50. Hopefully you've seen now what all of the special populations are. Uh, it starts with pediatric patients. So on page 51, definitely know all your uh, specific numbers for pediatric patients. So for instance, your neonate classification is only the first 28 days after birth. Infant is two to 18 months. So you need to know those exact numbers as you're going through this. Uh, in general, pediatric patients, there's a couple different things that you need to pay attention to. So we need to keep these patients warm because they're smaller um, and need to keep their fluids up even more than with adults because they have small underdeveloped kidneys. So keeping the fluids up, keeping them warm is more important than with adult patients. Uh, if you look at the right side of the page, the long paragraph talks about all the physiological factors that must be taken into account with pediatric patients. So make sure you read through all of that. I want to look at the second sentence. So neonates and infants are startled easily, so a quiet environment is essential. Preschool and school-aged children may use words to the same general ends that adults do to inform, persuade, or manipulate, but they will not use the language in the same way. So they might use the same words, but they're gonna communicate with you in a different way. And before that, it's telling you even more than usual, be quiet in the room. Don't startle this child right before they have surgery because they have enough anxiety as it is being taken away from their parents and their safe spot. So make sure you are making them feel comfortable if you get to have that interaction with your pediatric patient. If you look down at the bottom, it starts going through some bullet points. So it says the following are some suggestions to help reduce the child's anxiety. So these first two I have seen in the OR. They let the child bring a favorite toy or stuffed animal into the OR. That's not something we're used to, right? We don't bring anything into the OR with the patient. We make sure they have nothing and even though their, their dentures are out, no jewelry, no nothing. With children, we do anything we can to make them more comfortable because they are not going to, as you know, how you fall asleep is how you wake up. So they're not going to handle dealing with this very well. They're gonna have a lot of anxiety. They might be crying as they fall asleep. So that means they're gonna wake up fighting and crying too. So anything that can put them in a better mood and make them more comfortable, we're gonna do that. So having a stuffed animal is just one of the many things that they can do. Um, during the pre-op visit, they introduce the child to all the individuals who will be on the surgical team. This depends on where you work. So some places you will still have the child come into the room and that's the first time you're seeing them. You're all gown and glove. You're gonna turn around to your patient and wave. Uh, every child is a little bit different. You know, some of them might be focusing on the people surrounding them and not even notice you. Some of them, they see a scary person with a mask and a gown and gloves on and they instantly start crying. <laughs> So unfortunately, every child is a little bit different and you just have to do the best you can to help them cope and deal with that anxiety. So it keeps going on page 53 now through all the rest of these bullet points. So let the patient, sorry, let the parent walk alongside while transporting the patient to surgery. This one happens very commonly. And then you'll also see they can accompany the child into the pre-op area if they let them do that there. So every hospital is set up a little differently. They have a certain cutoff for the parents. Uh, when I was at St. Francis South, actually, I saw when they did tonsils and adenoids, 
uh, they would actually let the parents come all the way to the OR door. So they stayed with them pre-op, all of those things, all the way until right at the surgery door. So every place is a little different, but we want to do anything we can to make that child uh, feel more comfortable. And then look at the last paragraph on that section on page 53. Since the development of rapid induction, this is talking about their anesthesia, the child no longer has to be subject to long induction times. Patients under two years of age are usually held by anesthesia care providers during induction. So that means actually holding them with a mask over their face, they're usually gonna go to sleep with just gas. So holding the mask on the face of the child or by holding the child's hands or arms, making sure that the OR is kept very quiet during induction. So, you know, if your book says it more than once, it's very important. So if you are setting up and there's a child in the room, I would just stop setting up because an adult might understand a couple little clinks of some metal and that you're trying to be quiet, a child does not understand. So you just need to stop what you're doing and think about what your patient is hearing and feeling at the moment. Okay, monitoring pediatric patients. So like I said, urine outputs, very important, but we're gonna go through all the different parameters on what they're going to monitor. So temperatures after that, and then you'll see urine output one more time, um, but in big bold green letters. So that is the part I want you to pay attention to. So neonates and infants are not usually catheterized due to high risk of trauma to the small urethra. So because of that, you'll have a collection bag instead. So it's still going to have the calibrations on it. So it's still going to give them a correct measurement of their urine output. So they can keep track of their fluid intake and output throughout the case. Uh, their cardiac function is very important during these cases. They might have an intra-arterial um, measurement and they might also have a central venous catheter. So what you need to do is read the differences, which you should already know, and just see when they're going to use a central line versus an uh, intra-arterial uh, measuring device. After that, you'll see arterial blood, blood gases will be monitored also by anesthesia. After that, I want you to look down at shock. So you should already know there's two types of shock. Uh, for this one, um, pediatric patients, it's focusing on septic shock for a reason. So septic shock is most commonly seen with infants and ch uh, children. So the CST should be aware that infants and children respond differently to shock as compared to older children and adults. So if you keep reading, bradycardia is the physical response instead of tachycardia. So that's why these anesthesia providers have to be very well trained and educated on these things because they are trained on the difference, differences between adults and pediatric, uh, you know, reactions to these drugs and to shock and everything else. So when they are looking at all their monitoring screens, they can know exactly what's going on and how to treat it. So this is all really all of this monitoring stuff is for your anesthesia provider. So that's why they're so specially trained and you'll see lots of CRNA and anesthesia providers that work solely in pediatrics because they want to specialize just in that because it is a little bit different. Okay, flip it over. It's going to keep going into some more stuff for anesthesia. Fluids and electrolytes. So this is what I was talking about with the newborns and infants and their small kidneys. So they don't tolerate dehydration well. Their immature kidneys cannot excrete water as effectively as the mature kidneys. So it's even more important to monitor their urine output, monitor their fluid input during the case. Uh, and that's important for you as far as keeping track of irrigation, right? That's your biggest thing as far as fluids. That's what you need to communicate to anesthesia. So even more so, you need to be precise in keeping track of how much irrigation you've used. Okay, after that, it goes into infection. We're still kind of with anesthesia, right? Because we're not administering these drugs or doing any of this pre-op stuff. But you still need to know the information for your CST. So even though you may not be giving antibiotics, certain situations you can catch mistakes. Uh, there's mistakes I've caught with allergies before because everybody else is running around doing something and I'm looking at that whiteboard during the timeout. So I could say, oh no, they're allergic to that antibiotic. We can't use that. I might catch a mistake. So you still need to know this information. So it has three antibiotics down at the bottom 
and all of them say the same thing, should not be administered to children. So that's what you need to really focus on. All three of these antibiotics should not be administered to children. I do want you to know the difference between them, so read through the differences. <laughs> I will stop at, well, number two, actually. So there's one, sulfa. There's two, <laughs> chloromedicine. Uh, this one, so it says should not be administered to children, is also associated with gray syndrome. So it can turn the infant skin gray. So very uh, specific reaction to this antibiotic, and that's why you can't give that one to children. And the next one, tetracycline. You know I have to give you my dad's stories. Tetracycline is what my dad was given when he broke his leg when he was in elementary school and was in the hospital for about a year. And I know I told you that story. Well, they didn't know at that time that you couldn't give tetracycline to children because it damages the enamel of their teeth. So his enamel of his teeth are stained a little bit gray, uh, and that's because of that antibiotic. So he is one of the many reasons why we know not to administer these antibiotics to children. So unfortunately, that's how we learn things in medicine, right? We try it and then learn from it and then get better and come back out with more standards and rules. <laughs> So no, all three of those antibiotics, um, I would stop after tetracycline. So let me read this part to you. So practically every antibiotic has been associated with the development of pseudomembranous intercolitis, most likely from the overgrowth of Clostridium difficile due to an antibiotic suppression of the growth of normal bacteria in the colon. So because you don't have that normal bacteria in the colon that you should, you um, are having this intercolitis. So this is what we've talked about, why people eat yogurt all the time, because it has that natural bacteria in there that we need in our gut to keep our gut, health, our gut healthy. So make sure you know that these antibiotics are connected to intercolitis, especially with children. So after antibiotics, um, you can read over metabolic and nutritional responses. I'm going to look at trauma. So this is specifically trauma for children. You really need to read this entire section and know it well. Accidents are the leading cause of death with children, age 1 to 15. Um, unintentional injury is what it is talking about. So these numbers are from the CDC and National Center of Injury Prevention and Control. Basically, from their research, they want people to focus on prevention. These accidents are still happening in large numbers, much more with children. So we want to focus on prevention moving forward in the future to prevent these accidents. Looking at your next paragraph, trauma in children is mo most often the result of blunt trauma. Head trauma being one of the most common ones for, um, for ad children and adults. Accounting for the majority of pediatric morbidity and mortality. After that, it starts talking about motor vehicle accidents. So motor vehicle accidents are the major cause of trauma in children. So car accidents, number one. Other causes seen more often in children than adults are falls, bicycle accidents, drownings, burns, poisonings. Childhood, uh, sorry, childbirth trauma and child abuse are also unique trauma circumstances. So you need to know all of that information lumped together. I can't help myself. I have to throw ATV accidents into this list also. I'm sure it goes with motor vehicle, bicycle accidents or something like that. But me personally working at a level one trauma center, I saw more ATV accidents than anything. Um, most of them not wearing helmets, unfortunately, and a lot of organ harvests that originated from ATV accidents on the road. So uh, ATV accidents are just so common. I don't know if it's because we are in Oklahoma. We got a lot of people living out in the country riding on ATVs, but very common. Um, I will say it says trauma at the top. Dealing with a trauma with a child can cause trauma to yourself. Uh, it can cause mental trauma to yourself dealing with that. So you have to decide before applying for a job whether you can handle something like that. Uh, when I applied at OU Medical, they asked me, do you want to work at the adult tower or the children's tower? And before they even got the sentence out, I said, adult's tower, please. Uh, now, I still had to deal with children. We did organ harvests on children. 
It was very traumatic at certain times, but it's also very rewarding at times. So just as you're in externship, really get to know yourself, see how you react to situations like this, and that should help you decide where to apply after your externship. So you can decide whether you handled it well with children or not, and you can decide whether you loved, you know, taking care of children or if it scared you and you want to work on adults instead. So you have lots of options in your career. So just keep that in mind as you are reading through these special populations because it's kind of focusing on a lot of different specialties. Okay, let's look at key differences in treatment. So know all of these bullet points as you're reading through it. I want to stop at the second bullet point. Seemingly insignificant blood loss may be a result of hemodynamic changes in children. I want to add that a small amount of blood loss in a child, especially if you're used to working in adult surgery, it just doesn't look like much, so it doesn't seem as severe. Luckily, the surgeon is the one that should be saying we need more blood or hemostatic agents or whatever the solution is, but you need to have that in your mind that a little bit of blood, just think times two that it's actually more bleeding is happening. It's just a very small patient. Um, after that, you can look other side of the page, same list of bullet points. Let's stop at vomiting. <laughs> so vomiting due to gastric dilation is common in children who experience trauma and surgical procedures. So a lot of times these kids are hyperventilating, freaking out, they're hyperventilating because of that, they can vomit because of that, they could aspirate. So you have to watch them very carefully. With children, sometimes, especially in a trauma situation, you might have to do non-scrub tech duties. So you might be doing more like nursing circulator duties, trying to calm this child down before surgery. So it just depends on whether you're scrubbed in or not. Uh, trauma in general, you, are, you go where you're needed. And you don't question whether that's your job or not, unless it's you know, something that's a legal aspect that you're not allowed to do, like say, checking blood, checking those medical record numbers. That's supposed to be done with a nurse. Something like that, you could say, I, I can't do that. That's not my job description. Other than that, you should jump for it, all hands on deck. Traumas, you're gonna do some things that are outside of your normal uh, job description. Okay, after that, read your general principles for pediatric emergency treatment. So especially read um, how pneumothorax and how to deal with that and trauma during birth. So after that, it talks about child abuse. So on that section, let me read that first sentence. Child abuse is a tragic event where the patient often presents with multiple traumatic injuries, some which may have already healed, especially in cases of fractures. So we learned in orthopedics that you can tell when it's a spiral fracture. So they can look at the x-ray and say that's a spiral fracture and they can make their judgments from there on whether a child has been abused or not. But usually, usually that is an indicator that there's been some abuse going on because there's that twisting motion happening that caused the spiral fracture instead of a different type of break. Okay, after that, let's move out of pediatric patient to obese patients is how it has it listed in your book. So I'm reading it out of your book. I'll go ahead and change that to bariatric patients. That's what it should say. <clears throat> so physiological and disease conditions related to obesity include, you should know all of those, all of these bullet points. So all the way to heart enlargement, to um, diabetes, dysfunctional, dysfunctional uterine bleeding. So all of these things that are associated with our bariatric patients you need to be aware of. What I want to add on to here for bariatric surgery is that a lot of the times to prepare the room, you will need bariatric attachments for the bed. So these are just little extenders that attach to the bed type, kind of like an arm board. So they're going to click onto the side to make your bed wider to accommodate your bariatric patients. If you look down at your third paragraph under review of surgical considerations, and this is on page 56. So it's talking about how anesthesia is dealing with these bariatric patients. So higher concentrations of anesthetic agents are required for these patients. This is due to the uptake 
of large amounts of adipose tissue. So remember, your adipose tissue retains those fat-soluble anesthetic agents. So anesthesia has to plan their anesthesia induction and waking up different because they are absorbing the, these anesthetic agents in a different way. They might hold on to it longer in their adipose tissue. So might have to use higher concentrations of those anesthetic agents. Okay, if you look down very bottom of page 56, it's talking about applying the Bovi pad and making sure there are no wrinkles. So with your bariatric patients, especially remember when you apply that grounding pad, there can't be any wrinkles or it can't be coming off at all. It has to be applied properly, stuck to the skin 100% flush with the skin, no wrinkles happening because as you know, that can cause uh, burn accidents to happen if the bovi pad is not placed correctly. Look at page 57, specific considerations of bariatric surgery. So perioperative EKGs are vitally important for these patients. Always gonna do EKG. Obese patients present specific difficulties for anesthesia and they are at a higher risk for anesthesia complications. You need to know that. This is particularly during induction. And you know that's when most of the complications happen with anesthesia is in induction. This risk is increased for patients with respiratory insufficiency. So if you're a bariatric patient and you have asthma, we are extremely worried about you as an anesthesia provider. We're gonna have the glide scope in there to help guide us as we intubate you. And we might have other uh, airway carts in the room to deal with the emergency if that happens. So anesthesia is always going to be on high alert and ready for anything with bariatric patients. If you look at right side, same page, top of the page, it's telling you the best position for pulmonary function. You should already know this, so this is review. As mentioned, the reverse Trendelenburg position significantly improves pulmonary function. Now, of course, these patients are going to have sequential compression devices on also, and that's to prevent a thrombus, DVTs, but we are going to do anything to help their pulmonary function and their blood flow throughout the case, because those are two of the issues that these patients are going to have. Okay, since we're talking about bariatric surgery, let's look at complications after gastric surgery. This is talking about gastric bypass. Let's do third paragraph. So look at gastric bypass. Patients can postoperatively develop severe gastric distension. Here's what I want you to add. What can happen, why they have the severe gastric distension, is because the bowel could become strangulated. So after the surgery, that bowel could become strangulated. So after they develop that um, gaseous distension, so it's sticking out of their stomach, in the distal bypass stomach, and it's gonna to lead to that gastric perforation. So it's damage of that surgery that they just did. If you look at the last sentence on that paragraph, because of this, an emergency laparotomy with insertion of a G-tube, gastrotomy tube, will be performed along with examination of the jejunum, so the jejunostomy that they made. So we're gonna do a gastrostomy tube to fix this, but we're gonna to have to do an emergent x lap to get in there. So this is definitely considered an emergent procedure, not necessarily a trauma because if they bring back, but it is an emergent procedure. Go ahead and flip it over, page 58. Diabetic patients. So yes, diabetic patients are considered a special population. So no, no, this whole section. <laughs> no number one and two, of course. Uh, diabetes mellitus is a genetic endocrine disorder that affects the pancreatic production of insulin and glucose tolerance in the body as a whole. Those well, all review, right? So review over type one and type two diabetes so you know the differences. Let's look instead at when performing surgery on diabetic patients, the following conditions must be prevented. So know all of your conditions that they're going to try to prevent during surgery. Look at something that you will need in the room. So for diabetic patients, you're gonna need a glucometer in the room because you can see all the tests they're going to be doing during the case to check on their blood sugar levels, but they're gonna need that glucometer in the room. 
After that, look at the complications associated with diabetes and be aware of all of those. A lot of them you should already know, like poor circulation because of vascular disease, uh, hypertension, infection, tachycardia. You should know most of these, so mostly a review for you. Look at preoperative. So know all your bullet points for preoperative care of patients with diabetes. Look at your third bullet point. Preoperative insulin dose is reduced to prevent intraoperative hypoglycemia or insulin shock. So again, they're gonna be constantly monitoring your blood sugars during your surgery because you're a diabetic patient. So they will have that glucometer in the room and lots of other things to constantly be monitoring your blood sugars. Okay, actually after that, you can just read it. So read your intra-op and post-op on diabetic patients. I will go to pregnant patients. So I'm on page 59. So pregnant patients, yes, we do surgery on pregnant patients. You need to know the details when we do surgery, when we don't. So your second paragraph gives you that answer. Surgical procedures performed during the first trimester should be postponed if possible. Abdominal procedures that have to be done, it doesn't say that, that have to be done and can't wait, are best performed in the second trimester. This is when the fetus is stable and a lot of the major organs are well differentiated. So that's the safest time to do abdominal surgery. If you look down at the bottom of that paragraph, you'll see for third trimester. Third trimester, there's a 40% risk of premature labor. Further difficulties are encountered due to displacement of organs by the enlarged uterus. So everything is different. The anatomical features aren't in the same spots because an enlarged uterus has pushed all those organs around. So we want to avoid doing surgery at all costs during that time. Uh, there are emergency situations, traumas that come in that are pregnant patients. These doctors and anesthesia providers have to work together and make a decision within minutes on whether to just do surgery on these patients or not. So think about a small amount of information you are learning on how they decide what to do with these patients. They got years and years of that. So if they are barking orders at you during a trauma, don't take it as an insult, take it as they know what they're doing, they know what to ask for. All you gotta do is give it to them. Give them what they need so they can take care of your patient. So yes, you will be working on Pregnant patients sometimes, but we want to avoid that in surgery if at all costs. There's lots of considerations with caring with pregnant patients, so I'll let you read through that, including the anesthesia, but that is because it's a review. So we know there's certain anesthetic drugs that you cannot give to pregnant women. So I will not go through that because you need to review that on your own. Let's look at page 60, intraoperative considerations for the ST. So make sure you read through all of these. Uh, this is all, I'm looking at this is all 100% review also, but it's telling you different considerations of what to have in the middle of the procedure. So it's all really good information. Let's look at immunocompromised patients instead. This first paragraph, I will tell you, you should read it all word for word and know it very well. So immunocompetence is the degree of function of an immune system that is designed to keep a patient free from infection and pathogens. We know who our immunocompromised patients are. We can unfortunately turn on the news right now and it can tell you who they think immunocompromised is right now. So immunocompromised patients, if you are at a facility that works with lots of children, you will have lots of immunocompromised patients. All hospitals have older patients, geriatric patients, and if you're at a facility that especially works with cancer treatment, you're gonna have lots of uh, cancer-related immunocompromised patients. So every facility you're at, you're gonna come across this and you need to be able to recognize that. Because as I said, even though you're not the one administering these drugs, these antibiotics, you can help. You can be aware of what's going on in the room and catch a mistake before it happens or maybe um, catch something that needs to be done just for this immunocompromised patient because you have this education. So read through all of this and especially where it says what's all included on the autoimmune diseases because these patients with autoimmune diseases have to have surgery too. So we have to be aware that they're immunocompromised. 
Let's go to that section. So it's the bottom of that first paragraph. Immunosuppressant drugs are also administered to recipients of organ transplants. This is to prevent the recipient's immune system from rejecting the newly transplanted tissues. So we already knew the rest of it, what our immunocompromised patients are, but now you remember that your transplant patients are also immunocompromised. Okay, so going along with our immunocompromised patients, let's look at AIDS patients. This is on page 61. So everything about AIDS should be reviewed for you also. So know that your AIDS goes along with all these opportunistic diseases. That's what this is focusing on. They're immunocompromised, they're gonna have other diseases to go along with it. And um, it's gonna go through what we're gonna do surgery for and what we're not. So complications, there's lots of different complications for you. So I'm gonna skip over that part. Considerations for the surgical team. The surgical team must show compassion, empathy, and professionalism without allowing personal feelings about the stigma attached to AIDS to impact the level of care they are providing for the patient. So you should never have a stigma about any disease when taking care of a patient. You should treat all patients exactly the same. I think it's sad that they had to type that in the book. We treat all patients exactly the same. This does not mean we don't take special precautions with AIDS patients. When your patient is completely asleep and unaware of what is happening, you can talk to your surgeon about how you want to handle the neutral zone because you want to handle the shape, the shapes, the sharps in a safer way so that nobody gets stuck during this case, especially. We're always careful with sharps. That's not treating the patient differently. We're going to treat the patient exactly the same, but intra-op, we are going to be a little bit different with the sharps and use a neutral zone so that we know nobody in this room has to worry about contracting this during the case. So I just wanted to point that part out. After that, it goes through routine procedures that are going to be difficult to perform on AIDS patients and it goes through all these bullet points. See that these are mostly circulator and anesthesia provider duties. This doesn't mean you're not gonna be helping out with them. Just something to point out. So if you're scrubbed in, you're not going to be doing these duties right here. Now we can look at the common surgical procedures for AIDS patients. <clears throat> these usually involve diagnostic biopsies, like a bronchoscopy, treatment of malignancies, infections, and virus infections that frequently occur in the respiratory tract. It says in the bili biliary tree that these patients are at high risk for opportunistic diseases to come in, especially in the bronch bronchial tree or the respiratory tract. So if you'll flip it over to page 62, a study of age patients requiring abdominal operations described four clinical syndromes that require surgical intervention. So it's telling you these four is what we're going to do surgery for. The other ones we should not, because we don't want to do surgery on these patients, right? That's putting us, the staff, at risk. So we only wanna do surgery on these patients if it is required, if it's really necessary to help their quality of life. So know your four surgeries that they could do with AIDS patients that are very common, like the, um, excuse me, like non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is I know one that you've all heard of before and are familiar with. So these are just four examples of the times when they will do surgery. Right after that, it gives you one more example. So uh, thrombocytopenia is another complication of your AIDS patients. For this, they could do a splenectomy um, to show, sorry, they can do a splenectomy if you have splenomegaly, so enlargement of the spleen. So that's another surgery that could be done on these AIDS patients. And I'll actually talk about a splenectomy when I get to trauma. Okay, now you get to physically challenged or sensory impaired patients. In general, you just need to be aware of whatever their disability or impairment is so that you can help them the best way that you can as a scrub tech. There are times where you'll have a patient that has special needs and you might need to stop setting up, scrub out, and help your nurse position and get this patient off to sleep. Then you can scrub back in and finish setting up before the surgeon's ready to scrub in. Look at your second paragraph. Patients with hearing impairments may be totally deaf or impaired 
to varying degrees. So if you have a deaf patient in pre-op, you will have an interpreter available so that they can properly communicate with the patient and educate them on the surgery that they're about to have and they can give proper consent to that. Another example is a paralyzed patient. So a paralyzed patient is gonna require extra staff to move them and extra precautions to make sure that they don't fall. There's lots of other examples. Those are just two that I picked out of your physically challenged and sensory impaired patients. Okay, let's look at your purple box, it's page 63. Caring for a patient with Down syndrome and surgery. So I wanna look at the last paragraph actually. Physically, uh, Down syndrome patients tend to have microgenia, muscle hypotonia, a flat nose, nasal bridge, microglossia, a short neck, and excessive joint laxity. These physical traits must be taken into consideration by the anesthesia care provider and PACU personnel. It really should be taken into consideration by everybody in the OR too, because we're still going to be transferring this patient usually awake from the stretcher onto the OR table before they go to sleep. So you still want to be aware of all of these things and that they might react differently to certain uh, commands during the induction process. So they're going to be a little, little bit different and it's giving you more information on specifically Down syndrome patients and surgery. After that, we get to isolation patients. I really could sp skip this part. It is coronavirus time in 2020. It's all on the news. Go ahead and turn on the news. It gives you the answer to everything you need to know about isolation patients. It really does. Uh, you guys know more about this than most classes before you, I'm sure, because of just what's happening in the world. So <laughs> I could add a lot more to that, but I will keep it to myself. So isolation patients. You need to know all the primary routes of transmission for these microorganisms. So know all your primary routes that are listed in your book. So droplet, airborne, contact, that's direct or indirect, vector-like insects, and fomites. So let's stop at fomite for a second. Fomite born. Medical devices, equipment, shelf and tabletops, contaminated surgical instruments. So anything in that hospital could have microorganisms on it. Hopefully we have learned that from what's going on on the news at least. We touch every door handle. Even if you're constantly washing your hands, everybody's touching something. So cross-contamination can happen very easily. <laughs> As far as isolation precautions go in surgery, it's gonna be specific per their uh, disease. So usually isolation precautions, you'll see they just come in with the yellow gowns on, so it's an extra layer of protection over their scrubs. Um, that's anywhere from MRSA patients to AIDS patients. So it's treated with the same contact gown, we just wear a contact gown. An example of something that's different that your books talks about is tuberculosis. So if you have a TB patient, you know you're going to have a special mask for that, that N95 mask. There are things that are specific to whatever the disease is for isolation, but in general, if there's a new disease, as you can see, we learn more about it slowly, right? So we started with, it, it only goes so far, and then it went to six feet, and now it might even be further. So all I have to say about all of these different precautions with isolation is err on the side of caution, always. Most of these diseases that you're going to be dealing with, with isolation precautions, you're going to know everything about it. It's not going to be, you know, new information like what we're dealing with now and learning about it on the news. This is stuff that's been around for a long time and we know how to handle it. We have a protocol for that. So even now, as new things are happening, we are making protocol for the future. So you will have a protocol and specific rules for isolation patients. So you'll know how to handle that by the sign on the door with all the instructions. Okay, let's flip over. <laughs> Page 64. So know all your fundamentals of care for isolation patients and that is wearing PPE. To go through all those bullet points, know the PPE you need and most importantly, the proper way to remove it. So, just as you guys haven't gotten to break out of your gown and gloves, you read about in the book, right? 
you pop your gown off, you inside it out, nothing on the outside is gonna touch you. Same idea when taking this PPE off. If you just put all this PPE on, touch the patient, and then touch your face to take the mask off, pretty pointless, right? Hopefully walking around uh, during this virus, you have seen some of that and it's irked you a little bit and you know better. You know how to not cross-contaminate for other patients, number one, and then number two, how to protect yourself. So putting on PPE is just as important as taking it off properly and of course, washing your hands right afterward. After that, let's look at specific airborne. So right after all the bullet points of PPE, the minimum allowable respiratory protection device is a filtering, non-powdered, air purifying, half-piece respirator. So this is a N95 disposable respirator. Disposable. Fit testing the, the respirator before exposure is critically important. So this is what I've told you guys about. You will do a fit test for working at any OR, any hospital. Um, so they will spray some sucrose while you have this big hood on your head and the mask and ask you if you can smell or taste anything sweet. That's what they're spraying. They want to make sure you don't smell or taste anything so that it's completely sealed around your mouth. Nothing's getting in and out. Having said that, you feel like you can't breathe when you're wearing them. It is very tight on your face. It does leave scars on your face. I have absolutely worn one of those for a 12-hour surgery. I was fine. I had marks on my face, it was very uncomfortable, but it did its job. So wear the PPE, wear it properly, take it off properly. That is my advice to you with isolation patients. Okay, we can move on, geriatric patients now. So know that geriatric patients are any patients over the age of 65. And look at the bottom of that first paragraph. The geriatric population represents a challenge to the entire surgical team because approximately 80% of geriatric patients present with one or more comorbidities or conditions entering the surgical environment. So what they're saying is geriatric patients have lots of different things going on, lots of different disease processes, so they're very ill. And you have to deal with medications differently. So a healthy patient anesthesia can just put them to sleep and it's no big deal. A sick patient with multiple comorbidities, it's a critical thinking game. They have to pick out just the right drug that doesn't interact with some other drug that they're already taking or some other comorbidity that they have. So it's very challenging for these doctors and anesthesia providers to figure this out. Let's look at page 65, top of the page. Elderly patients are often arthritic and suffer from restricted movements. They also have fragile skin that requires special consideration when lifting and transporting. Cardiovascular and respiratory impairments must also be considered for anesthesia and positioning. Elderly patients can become hypothermic in the OR, so warm blankets and forced air, like your bear hugger, may be applied to the patient during the procedure. All of these are accurate. You need to be more careful transferring these to geriatric patients. I want to focus on where it said thin skin. So your green box here, your table is important. You need to know that. Your first one it talks about is the integumentary system. So their skin is very thin. Think about it, we're putting IV lines in their hands and we're taping it. They could have other central lines, they're all taped on their skin. Then we're putting a drape directly on their skin, taping it to their skin. Those stickies are going to stick to their skin. At the end of the case, Hours later, you have to remember that their skin is very thin. This isn't a normal patient. You can't just grab the drape and rip it off and throw it in the trash. You might want to put one hand on the patient's skin and gently peel that drape off so that it doesn't rip the skin or tear it or hurt it in any way. I have 100% seen a doctor grab the drape and go to pull it off and just ripped a 80 something year old patient's skin with the drape. They weren't very aggressive with the drape. They were ripping it off like we rip off a drape every time, but you have to be extra gentle, extra soft with these geriatric patients' skin. So that's moving them to and from the surgical table and especially removing the drapes. So make sure you're watching out for that thin skin and being very gentle with it. And after you look at that green table, you should be able to flip over to page 66. 
So let's look at substance abuse patients. So studies suggest that 30 to 80% of substance abuse abusers suffer from coexisting psych psychiatric illnesses. So that means they have multiple things going on. So they may require a little more pre-op uh, talking to by anesthesia, the nurse, uh, the surgeon, because they might need a little more explanation on things or verifying some details. Uh, look at the top of your next paragraph. The surgical team will benefit from the presence of a counselor or social worker to provide assistance to the team and the patient. So that's if they want that, that is usually available to them by hospitals, just like interpreters are available. So they can get some counseling or uh, help from a social work to give them some more assistance on their decisions for the case. Okay, after that, I can finally go to trauma patients. So for trauma patients, I am going to share my screen so you can see my trauma slideshow. And of course, I have more to add on these than the others. So with trauma patients, the first thing I'm gonna talk about is the golden hour. So yeah, if there's a golden hour that you want to start treating these patients within that window. But what's even more ideal is to do it before the golden hour. So we wanna get the patient in the room as quickly as possible to prevent their death. We are literally saving lives in this golden hour. The golden hour is a term you should know. You should know all the details in this first paragraph. Practically, I want you to know that it's gonna be quicker than an hour. We're gonna to try to get that patient in here way well before an hour because the best time to treat an injury is immediately. So we want to rush them to the proper level trauma, trauma facility and treat them from there. So I will go through some of the stuff. So your golden hour, know your timeline which is listed on here. And then with that, know how are they deciding where to send these patients? You know that there's different levels, but what does that actually mean to you? So know in your book that there's four different levels and know the differences between them in your book. On here, I put more details. So I know this chart is a little hard to read, but it's got all the details of what is the difference between a level one versus all of these other levels. So for just a moment, I want to look at level one. So level one has uh, operating room, ICU, of course, trauma surgeon available in the hospital at all times. So for us, this meant other hospitals I'd worked at, we always had a trauma surgeon on call available. They'd be here in five minutes. This means there's one on call for in five minutes. There's another one who's right here standing next to me ready to go. So that is one of the many differences between level one and some of the other services. So let me go through some more here. Anesthesiologist in the hospital at all times, um, but shared services. Neurosurgeon in the hospital at all times, but with shared services. So see how it's very specific with the um, attending surgeon, um, neurosurgeon and orthopedic surgeon. So they have very specific parameters for what they want for a level one trauma. So let me give you some other factors that they might take into consideration though. There's multiple times when something happened, like statewide, maybe a tornado, um, maybe a big accident happened, it's all over the news, we might be full. So our ER, our OR trauma facility is full to the brim. They will go on what is called divert. So we have so many patients that we have to go on divert. So it doesn't matter if there's another level one trauma patient that we can't take on. We, have, we only have so many beds. So there's not a massive difference, even though looking at this chart, it looks like there's a massive difference between level one and level two. When it really comes down to it, a level two hospital is gonna save your life just like that level one hospital. So even though I talk a lot about the difference with a level one trauma facility because that's where I worked the majority of my career. I want you to know that example St. Francis is a massive hospital that absolutely handles traumas all the time and very well. So they might get a level one trauma even though they're a level two trauma center. So just keep that in mind. Traumas are received everywhere. So even though it's more involved at a trauma center like a level one because that's their specialty, 
That doesn't mean level two can't handle your trauma. Uh, you're gonna have lots of trauma experience at St. Francis and other level two hospitals. So I just wanted to point that out. But know your requirements in the book and then this will help you understand your categorization of one through four level traumas, um, trauma facilities actually. After that, it talks about schematics. So schematics or the mechanism of injury. So you'll see it says mechanism of injury. So this is a prediction of injuries based on the forces and motion evolved in the injury event. So it's helping them predict what the injury is gonna be basically. So look at page 67. Three factors are important when considering the injury of a patient will sustain due to these various forces. So these are the forces. Flexibility of the tissue, shape of the injuring force, whoever's hitting you, and then velocity of the injuring force. So they take these three factors into considering the injury with this patient. So they're looking at schematics after they have already been sent to the proper uh, categorized trauma facility. So after that, I will get into specific traumas. So blunt traumas. This was hard for me as a brand new scrub tech. A lot of the original traumas I saw were blunt traumas, so there's no penetrating thing sticking out of them. I don't see any bleeding happening. If they have a gown over them, you're not gonna see this intense abdominal distension, so you don't know what's going on with them. You're just going off of whatever the surgeon and the people communicating with you is saying about this case. So I put this picture on here so you could see an example of you could remove that gown and see this and go, oh my goodness, we have some severe internal bleeding going on here. There's a lot of swelling on this patient's right side. We know it was a blunt trauma, maybe a motor vehicle accident. So look at both of these videos of a splenectomy. Splenectomy is the most common case I personally did for blunt traumas. Uh, blunt traumas you'll see in your book go hand in hand with doing splenectomies, unfortunately. A lot of the times these go hand in hand with motor vehicle accidents. So you get in a really bad motor vehicle accident, you had a blunt trauma with your vehicle, your steering wheel, whatever hit you. Um, a lot of times that's causing internal bleeding. So we need to get into the operating room and get that spleen out ASAP. So looking at blunt trauma, last sentence. The spleen is the organ most frequently injured in motor vehicle accidents, usually punctured by a fractured rib. Three types of collisions can occur in a motor vehicle accident. Car collides with another object. Person inside the car collides with an object like steering wheel, dashboard. Internal body surface collides with a rigid bony surface. So lots of different ways that this can happen, but blunt trauma, extremely common because motor vehicle accidents are extremely common. So as you're reading through this, learn your acronyms. Are they gonna waste the time saying motor vehicle accident? No, they're gonna say MVA. And if they are talking in the OR very quickly with a lot of different acronyms, you may not catch it all unless you are studying all your stuff and really understanding this. So catch all these little acronyms so that if you're in a trauma situation, you know what they're talking about. They're not speaking a foreign language to you. Okay, so you saw all the different ways that you can get this blunt trauma, specifically from motor vehicle accidents. But I want you to look at your common injuries sustained in motor vehicle accidents, um, starting with not wearing a seat belt. So you'll see it says facial injuries. I've seen this with people wearing a seat belt. So sometimes in the accident, have you ever seen a tire pop off of a car? If you haven't, it's a little terrifying, but we have seen accidents where a tire will pop off, it goes directly into the vehicle behind them, smashes their face, so they have multiple facial fractures, sometimes occluding their airway. So it's absolutely a trauma coming in, but we're gonna have to fix their airway number one and then deal with all of the facial, facial fractures. So, so many different options on motor vehicle ac accidents. After that, wearing a combination of lap and shoulder belts and airbag inflation. So you know that airbags can cause injuries, unfortunately, instead of just saving you during your car accident. So there um, are specific injuries that happen from airbag inflation, and that goes with facial fractures too. So lots of different options here. If you'll read down, you'll see liver or spleen lacerations, 
those are what I am used to seeing as traumas. So like this case you're looking at right here, um, and also liver lacerations. Okay, that's my blunt trauma slide. You should watch Massive Splenectomy, that's on here. This one, I specifically put that it's cancer, so you know that it wasn't an emergent splenectomy. It's just the biggest spleen I've ever seen, so I wanted you guys to see it also. Uh, and then, of course, I put an emergency splenectomy on there, so you can see how much blood is in the abdomen when they first open it, because that spleen is ruptured already, right? So that abdomen is full of blood, and they cannot see what they're doing. And I'll just go ahead and be a commenter for you during that video. I'm yelling suction, suction, suction the whole time I'm watching it because they need to get another suction tube in there so that the surgeon can see what they're doing. So even though it's not the most beautiful emergency splenectomy, it shows you really how much blood is going to be in the abdomen. So maybe you can see why I stress so much on get the suction in there for the surgeon. All right, I'll move on to penetrating wounds. Got some awesome pictures here for you for penetrating wounds. Uh, I always have a list in my head ready to go for traumas. Now this list I have here, it's the same for blunt traumas as penetrating traumas, but I always was really listing it in my head with this penetrating traumas because first thing we have to do is remove the item, right? As soon as we remove that item, blood is just going to rush everywhere. So I want to have all these things ready to go. Suction, laps, vascular clamps, silk suture, hemostatic agents. Now, if you know it went through a big vessel, you can go ahead and add small proline suture to that also to do a vessel repair. But this is a good, just basics to start off with. And if you are nervous about trauma situations like this, Hopefully looking at these small lists I make will make it less stressful for you because yeah, it's a stressful environment, it's a trauma, but you only need so many things. All you have to do is stop the bleeding. That's all you have to help the surgeon do. That's the way I always looked at it. It wasn't necessarily, oh my God, what's gonna happen? What's gonna be done? It didn't matter what's gonna happen. I'm ready for anything, I'm a scrub tech. So it's just, thinking of it the second before the surgeon thinks of it and anticipating their every move. <laughs> okay, penetrating trauma. So look at your first sentence. Uh, results when a foreign body object passes through the tissue. Most common foreign objects are bullets and knives. The extent of the injury depends on the following. So know all of your bullet points, the type of object, the energy used, all of those things. And then you need to know specifics for bullets. So bullet injuries are low velocity or high velocity. Traveling at 2,000 feet per second or slower or high velocity above 2,000 feet per second. Factors that affect the extent of the injury include all of these different bullet points. So the velocity, how close they are to the victim, all of those things you need to read through. So know all of these details. After that, it gets into trauma scoring. So I will tell you a quick story before I get to that. So I had multiple days when I was working that I saw machete, <laughs> machete fights, I guess. We kept on hearing the stories back from the paramedics, you know, paramedics bring the patient into the ER where we're down there checking the trauma and then bring them up to the OR. So it's kind of interesting if you get to work at a trauma facility to be watching the news in the break room and then you hear the pager go off. Hey, what was on the news is now in the ER. And then you can decide whether the news is telling you all the story or not because you hear the story from the paramedic. So very interesting to work at trauma facilities, but <laughs> you will get a little bit different story depending on who you're talking to. Uh, but at least for me specifically, I remember this these machete cases very vividly because we saw the patients in sequential order. So at first we saw the person that was the victim being slashed with a machete on their back. And then the next we saw the blunt force trauma that was inflicted on the person that was using the machete. So you're going to see the craziest things if you choose to work at a trauma facility. Uh, this big samurai sword, for instance, that's pictured here. I've seen a trauma just like that. Now, my first reaction was, why does this guy have a samurai sword in his house? But you never know what people are gonna have. You never know if you're gonna see a machete accident, 
You're gonna have somebody swallow a Lego or somebody come in with a broomstick in their neck. You never know what's gonna happen. So that's what I liked about trauma. You never know what's coming up the door. You just gotta be ready for anything. Well, there's my machete story so I can move on to my boring slide of trauma scoring. So trauma scoring, this gives you all the numbers so you can kind of understand how they're coming up with this Glasgow coma scale and the score that they're getting. So injuries are scored using the revised trauma score. So that's that black picture I have for you there to assess the severity of the traumas. So this RTS involves the Glasgow Coma Scale, which I've included, as well as other factors. So I just want you to think, what are they considering when rating this patient? So how they rate this patient decides how they decide which level of a hospital they send them to. So depending on their score, they could decide, well, they're not that bad. They're not a level one trauma, so we'll send them to this level two or maybe they'll decide their score is so bad that we need to send them to the closest hospital. It doesn't matter what level they are. Uh, they might realize that they need life-saving surgery that can only be done at this level one trauma center. So there's a lot of communication behind the scenes things that are happening between our emergency responders and the hospital. So they're all in constant communication. It's like a dance that's constantly happening uh, that's working well together. So we're constantly, it's a, something that never stops. They're constantly bringing in more patients into the ER. It's not anything that ever shuts down or closes. So it's just constant carousel that's happening. Um, so it doesn't go into any more details as you can see in your book. So because of that, I added uh, this extra blue chart here. So you can kind of see some of the things that they're looking at deciding what to do with these patients. So like limb ischemia for one, so if it's an orthopedic injury and they think oh, we're losing, you know, blood, they might lose that limb. They might go ahead and bump them up to a level one. Um, something like them being in shock, you know, maybe they, they realize that any hospital can handle that. So we're going to take them to this level two. It's really up to the people in charge of the hospital and the people making this carousel happen every day. After that, you can look at considerations for the surgical tech. You can read all of that, um, but I'm going to add some more to it as you can see. So my considerations for the surgical tech are actually right there at the end. So I'm gonna skip for a second. Considerations of the surgical tech. What's not in your book that I want you to add? Keep the spine in alignment when transferring these patients. So that's the same thing with positioning too. You gotta keep their spine in alignment. You don't wanna cause more injury while you're trying to take care of this patient. Multiple cases of different specialties can happen at the same time. So the example that's in your book, doing a orthopedic trauma while doing craniotomy, I've uh, absolutely done that. And it was actually a bilateral trauma. So they were fixing two broken legs while we were doing a craniotomy. That's a lot of things happening at once that gives more a chance for mistakes to happen. So you need to be more vigilant and paying attention to what's going on in the room. Uh, third, most important to me, the count can be skipped in trauma situations, as you know. If there's no time to count, we're gonna save their life. If you do have time to count, even a moment, why not count it? I was a little bit hated for that at my job and I had no issue with that because I knew that I could go home and sleep well at night because if my patients survive, we did a count. I know that there's nothing left inside that patient. Now they know on trauma patients that that might happen. So they might leave the room saying no count was done. They're gonna do an X-ray, make sure nothing's in that belly. I can't live with that. What if they miss that lap on that X-ray? What if they miss that instrument? So I always count if I have time. There's many traumas that I knew I didn't have time to count the instruments. And so I picked up all the laps and just started throwing them into the basket of instruments and counted them that way. So I could count through 20, 30 trauma laps very quickly. I might not have time to count the whole major tray and open heart tray and sternal saw pieces, all that stuff. But an instrument is 100% gonna pop up on x-ray, right? The lap sponge should too, but if I have time to count it, I'm gonna count it. So I hope that you take that seriously like I do. And if you have time to count it, count it. 
most important thing, have your crash cart in the room. If you have a designated trauma room OR, then you'll already have it in the room. After that, keeping your patients warm as soon as they get in the room, blankets, bear hugger, warm saline irrigation. You'll see in some of my pictures at the end, they have something that's called a level one fluid warmer. This um, can be put under the patient, so it's already on the OR table, and it's got hot fluid going through it constantly, so it's keeping that patient warm. So there's lots of devices that are specific for trauma patients that are at trauma facilities that you guys have not seen yet. So lots of cool options out there. Uh, as the scrub tech, have extra supplies available in the room. I had double of everything. You know, suction's important, but Bovi also. There are times where two surgeons are working at the same time in a trauma, and if you have two bovies, we're going twice as fast to get in there. So sometimes two suctions, two bovies, lots of trauma laps, silk suture, proline suture if it's a big vessel, and all hemostatic agents. So that's whatever the surgeon's preference, but I just bring it all in there. And then last, have instruments available if the case were to evolve into something different. So for instance, they say you have an emergent x lap coming up for gunshot wound to the chest. I've heard this before. They didn't say abdomen, they said chest, that's odd. They might think it's low enough to where we need to do an x lap. But what if once we get in there, we realize, oh, the bleeding's coming from up in the chest, not from the abdomen. The first thing that surgeon's gonna say to me is sternal saw. They're not gonna think through it slowly and say, oh, we might have to open the chest and it'd be a conversation and you get some warning, you get no warning. So you need to have it all available in the room right there. So when he says sternal saw, all you're gonna do is repeat it to your circulator. I need the sternal saw now. So you need to be very direct, very loud. Uh, I do think that working in trauma changed who I was for the better. I was very quiet and reserved, and there are situations where you need to stand up for your patient. Your patient is asleep. That is your job to stand up for them and make sure that this surgery is done correctly so that you can save their life. You are a part of saving people's lives, especially in trauma procedures. So I hope you learn to speak up if you're a very quiet person. And if you're a person who talks a lot, I hope the opposite. I hope you learn that there's certain times where you need to not say a thing and just pay attention to the surgery and what's gonna happen next. So when I'm talking about speaking loudly and talking, I'm saying when you have to. So like when I need to communicate with my circulator in the middle of a trauma, there could be 10 people in that room running around. They're checking blood, they're getting laps, they're getting all these different things. So you might feel like you are yelling across the room. You're not, you're getting what you need for your patient. You're doing what your surgeon asked so the surgeon can save this patient's life. So get your loud voice out if you want to be in traumas and deal with trauma situations. Okay, after your special considerations, it goes into preservation of evidence. So you should already know this because I've actually gone over this in class because I've dealt with a lot of gunshot patients, but there's more than just bullets when it comes to evidence. So I want you to look at all your bullet points under preservation of evidence, and I'm at six, <laughs> number six. So hair, tissue, gunpowder, residue, anything found on the hands victim could be considered uh, evidence. Uh, they can put this in a plastic bag. You guys have seen those uh, plastic little biohazard bags, so you can put them in there. And they could also be put in that bag and taped into place. Um, plastic bags should be removed and cotton swabs used to collect the gunpowder residue. I actually have not done that before, collected gunpowder residue or seen that happen in the OR. What I have dealt with is the chain of custody with the bullets many times. I will say that if you are the one who actually, they hand the bullet to you, you will have to sign some paperwork when you scrub out of that surgery. Uh, there's many, yeah, I can say this, there's many that I have been scrubbed in and that's just not how it works. The chain of custody has to keep going. And so I gave them permission to sign my name on that. I was giving verbal permission for them to sign my name because I've scrubbed in and there's no way for me to sign that chain of custody paper. So if they need that out before, the surgery is over, then they're going to have to sign for me. Otherwise, you're going to have to sign that chain of custody at the end. So chain of custody of evidence is documented in writing, accounting for identification of individuals on the surgical team who handled the evidence and the order of handling. So it's extremely detailed. 
exactly how it was handed to you, all of these things. So you're gonna have to remember what just happened and write that down in detail. I will remind you again that metal instruments damage bullets. So it could leave scratches or markings on the bullet. And this is evidence. They are trying to go through this and deal with a crime that happened, trying to, uh, trying to give some justice. So if you're damaging that bullet because you decided to clamp a coker onto it, there's no reason for that. So you should already know that you shouldn't use metal clamps or anything sharp, rigid with these bullets. So they should grab it with their hand if at all costs. Um, there are some pickups that, you know, are little biopsy pickups that you could pick it up with or maybe some Russian forceps, but even those have teeth on it. So you're really not supposed to put any metal clamps onto your bullets, but know that you will be filling out some paperwork for chain of custody. Okay, so after that talks about post-traumatic stress patients. So you need to read through all of that, and then I will give you what I added on to the end here. So what I added on to the end is real trauma. This is the way I look at it. If you are at a trauma facility, they will, with a nurse, send you downstairs to check traumas. I shouldn't have said downstairs. They will send you to the emergency room to check traumas. This means you need to decide quickly. You need to have your education and decide, know whether this patient's coming straight up to the OR or not. So there's many times where I've been in the ER and I thought this patient's coming right up to surgery. So I picked up the work phone that's on my side I said, they're coming right up to surgery, so get ready for a thoracotomy. I hang up the phone, and then this happens. We don't have time to go to surgery. This surgeon, this ER doctor probably, made a split-second decision and decided to clamshell thoracotomy this patient in the ICU and not go to the OR because we're not going to make it there. I need to get into that chest, put my hands on the heart, and start cardiac massage as soon as possible. So this will happen sometimes and you need to know how to handle it. So I put a picture for you so you can see what the thoracotomy tray usually looks like in the ER. It's Very different than in the OR, right? It's just the basics. So you need to, if you're ever down there, just think order of operations. So you need to get them that knife number one, and then you can watch this video of a penetrating trust trauma to like see the order of instruments and how you're going to be handed to them. But really it's gonna be knife rib spreader. That's really it, because they need to get their hand on the heart and start cardiac massage. So these are typically for penetrating chest traumas, but there's different variations with clamshell thoracotomies. And you'll hear this term, clamshell, and they're typically talking about one side. Sometimes they have to extend the incision, like this one, all the way around. So you can see the entire clamshell. You can see the sternum in the center sometimes has to be divided. Um, and you can see that in the top picture but it's so we can get our hand on the heart and start cardiac massage as soon as possible. So this closure is very intense. These patients do not do well in recovery. This is a last ditch effort. This is not something that they take lightly. This, is, this patient is dying unless I do a clamshell thoracotomy on them right now and start making their heart beat. This is a legit trauma is what I would call it. So these are usually done in ICU. I've only seen this once in the actual operating room because if they have time to get them up to the operating room and do all of those things, then we might approach this in a different way to get to the heart. We might approach it um, with a sternotomy, like typically to get into the center of the heart, but that takes time, right? To get up to the OR, get everybody ready, and then get the sternal saw and crack that chest open and then get to the heart. This can be done in five to 10 minutes maybe less. So you should, the idea is you should as a scrub tech know where these things are in the ICU. That was probably my biggest mistake as a brand new scrub tech. I knew where everything was in the operating room. I was safe up there, but I was sent down to the ER all the time to check traumas. I should have known to make myself familiar with those rooms also, but I was not. So when this happened to me the first time, all I heard was rib spreader now. I'm looking around the room and it took me a while to find it. Now, as soon as I found it, I opened it and handed it right over and we got this to happen. And the, the patient's heartbeat came back after cardiac massage. It was a wonderful day. But man, that's seconds that could, 
that could kill somebody. That's seconds. That could save somebody's life. That could kill somebody. You need to know where things are in your surroundings. That's your job. So even though a facility like mine didn't tell me, hey, make yourself familiar with the ER, they want you to figure that out for yourself. So pay attention to your surroundings, especially in places where you're not all the time, where it's more random, like the ER or maybe the ICU, still be aware of your surroundings so that you can help in a trauma situation, especially a clamshell thoracotomy. So here's my favorite picture. So you can actually see what it looks like when they get in there. You'll see that they have exam gloves on, on one of these, not sterile gloves. So we're not worried about sterility. We're worried about starting cardiac massage on the heart. So do these patients have a high risk of infection? Absolutely. They might die of infection but they didn't die that day because their heart stopped beating. We got in there quickly and saved their life because of this. So don't worry about sterility. Just think about how quickly can we get into this chest? Okay, so that brings me to the end here. So I wanna show you what it looks like after a trauma is all over. So these are both operating rooms. Let me point out the extra stuff here. So here is this level one fluid warmer that I was talking about. This is for anesthesia providers to keep the patient's fluids warm before we're putting it in the patient because they're already losing body temperature, right? They have a lot of blood loss and their body temperature is down. We need to bring it back up as quickly as possible. So they're going to warm that blood and any other fluid that goes into that patient's veins. They also have, I don't see it on here, it's just like this, but it hooks up to the operating room table. So there's a green pad that lays on the operating room table table that like I said has warm water flowing through it constantly. So it's got these little tubes and it's got warm water constantly throwing, flowing through it so it feels hot to the touch. So when the patient is laying on that, that increases their body temperature throughout this case. So even though they're losing that body temperature, we're helping bring it back up with all of these factors. And of course you see the horrendous mess all over the floor, right? Yes, you're gonna be helping clean this up. You do not expect housekeeping to clean up your mess for you. You're absolutely gonna clean it as a team. I wanna point out safety. I have seen many people get stuck with a sharp during a situation like this because a trauma just happened. Things were being thrown everywhere. Who knows what's on the floor? Do not reach without looking. You look very carefully, clean up very slowly and carefully. Even if people are rushing you, I still took my time because I'm not gonna get stuck with a needle because I'm cleaning up a mess like this. I wanna also point out that there is blood products on the floor back here. I never touch those blood products as a scrub tech. They have to check that blood, right? They check the blood as it comes in, check with their medical record number, make sure we're using the right kind of blood. Same thing with all the other blood products like platelets. They need that information. During a trauma like this, they're not gonna have time to chart all of these things. So what they do is just leave the blood bags on the ground. When they get back into the room after the patient is okay, or they can come back to the room, they can start charting these things. So they're gonna need all those blood bags that are sitting on the floor to chart that medical record number and the details that are on that bottle. So in general, I have told you guys, don't mess with anesthesia's area unless you are specifically told to turn over that area because there's drugs up there that you're not supposed to be around. This is another time where you should be extra careful of anesthesia's area because they might have some things up there that they're gonna have to chart after the trauma is over. So just some things for you to pay attention to. Uh, and of course I put, wear your PPE while you are cleaning this trauma up. Look how much blood is everywhere. You're gonna get that on you. So I typically left my gown on as long as I possibly could while cleaning up. So. Your, your patient's out of the room. It doesn't matter if you're contaminated or not. You're just gonna clean with your gown and gloves on before taking your gown and glove off. So they typically ask for a terminal clean after this case. So it's not just a turnover. You wanna do a terminal clean because we don't know what these patients have, right? They're trauma patients. That could have been a hepatitis B patient. We had no idea. You don't know what these patients have. So we're just gonna treat it like they had a contact precaution. We're gonna do a terminal clean. Okay, that brings me to my last one. So, <laughs> wear your shoe covers. This is your picture to warn you to wear your shoe covers, but as you can tell, sometimes shoe covers are not enough. So they have big boots for arthroscopic cases usually that would cover that entire leg that's covered in blood. 
So if you ever have time, you know that you're going to be doing trauma that day, you know you have time to put on an impervious boot instead of a shoe cover, do it. It'll save your stuff. Uh, these tennis shoes right here, this exact thing has happened to me. So the second we started the trauma, we cut in, all the blood poured out of the stomach, and we had a drape with the pouches on the two sides, what you guys are used to seeing in the lab, most of you. You have a pouch on either side. That filled up with blood and overflowed onto my shoes within what felt like two minutes. I don't know how much time it really was, but actively during the case, I could just feel the blood sinking into my shoes and into my socks. And I knew this was the grossest thing that has ever happened, but their shoes, I'm gonna throw them away, I'll be just fine. Definitely took a shower at work that day. I was soaked in blood, kind of like this surgeon's hand right here. So let's stop at that one. If you get a microscopic hole in your glove, you will see this. I want you to think every time after you take your sterile gloves off that you're looking at that. What if there's a microscopic hole in there? You have blood on your hand, you don't know it. You take your gown and gloves off, you're cleaning up, you touch your face. You know better than that, don't touch your face of course, but I'm telling you, you need to wash your hands and clean up after you take your gown and gloves off. You might be thinking, of course I do, that's common sense. Most people don't take the time to do that because you're in a rush. You're ready to do the next thing, the next case. You need to take a moment and stop and wash your hands because of pictures like this. Oh, that brings me to the next one. So when there's so much blood on the ground, we have all of this equipment right next to it, it's gonna get coated in blood too. So now this bear hugger, ugh, this ivy pole, the foley, everything is just covered in blood and it coagulates immediately. So I want to point out that you need to clean these things before sending the patient. If you've ever been with a family member in ICU, if you saw that Foley catheter bag and the chest um, atrium, sorry, the plurivac system, if you saw that it was covered in coated blood, that would scare you, right? Wow, my you know, family member just went through this crazy surgery. There must have been blood everywhere. They don't need to know this. You need to clean that stuff up. So just like the dressing, it's the only thing the patient sees, this is the only thing the patient's gonna see, these tubes that come with them and they're dressing. So you need to take a second and wipe and clean those things off so that the patient's family doesn't have to see that. And then you see the same thing up here, blood all over the shoes, blood all over the plants, blood, sharps, all kinds of stuff all over the floor. This is not laziness, this is trauma. You don't have time to deal with things like that. You throw it on the floor and you pay attention to the patient. When you come back to the room, you can deal with the mess. So just take a look at these pictures and some of these procedures that I put on here for you to watch. And hopefully you can decide whether you actually like doing trauma or whether you're more of a person who wants to work at a surgery center. But you always want to be prepared. So even though I just said that, I hope you know that if you have a patient at a surgery center, it could still turn into an emergency. As a scrub tech, you need to be ready for anything. So even if you plan on not doing things like this, this isn't your cup of tea, you wanna work at a little surgery center, you wanna maybe work in endoscopy, doing EGDs and colonoscopies, whatever you wanna do, you need to be prepared for an emergency. You don't know what's gonna to happen to that patient and they're under your care. So even if this is not your cup of tea, I suggest you read through it and make sure you know how to handle an emergency when it happens, and especially a trauma patient if it comes up. Um, I got lots of more stories about traumas, but most of them are HIPAA violations, so I can't really share them. So if you want some more stories or if you have specific questions about traumas, feel free to ask me. So if you have any more questions about anything else too, be sure to ask me, and I'm here to help you guys. So if you need anything else, let me know. I will see you soon.